morning, everyone. I'm Jackie Spear, and along with uh, Charlie Dent and Rush Holt and Steve Sivers, I am one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. This is our first program of the year, so we're very grateful that you took time out of your schedules to be here, and you will not be disappointed. Uh, as you probably are aware, this re research caucus is a forum to highlight some of the essential and incredible work being done at our leading research institutions across the country with funding from none other than the National Institute of Health and other critical federal programs. I'm blessed with several of the top biomedical research institutions in the country right smack dab in the Bay Area. In fact, the number one recipient um, is UCSF, which we're very proud of. Uh, a perfect example, however, today is not from UCSF, but from the um, historic, um, how should I put it, um, rivalry that exists between UCSF and Stanford University. Dr. Krishna Shinoy is a professor of neurobiology and bioengineering at Stanford University. My son's a graduate at Stanford, so I have a great deal of fondness for it, but I must also um, expose the fact that um, I'm a UC grad through and through. In fact, Stanford rejected me as a, a high school senior, so I'm still painting from that um, particular experience. Uh, Professor Shinoy directs the Neural Prosthetic Systems Lab, uh, which is named NPSL, where his group conducts neuroscience and neuroengineering research to better understand how the brain controls movement. Uh, and developing medical systems to assist those with movement disability. So you can understand how particularly our Veterans Administration, um, our U.S. Department of Defense, is critically in interested in the work that's being done by Professor Shinoy. He's also the director of Stanford Brown University's UCSF, UCL, DARPA, DSO research program termed REPAIR to advance the basic neuroscience and neuroengineering essential for the next generation brain recovery and medical devices. His researchers right now are working on brain implantable prosthetic systems that can help disabled people translate neural signals from the brain into control signals for prosthetic arms, computers, and other assistive devices. In simple speak, something that maybe I can understand, uh, doctor's uh, research is helping humans operate computers, write emails, and drive wheelchairs with nothing but their brains. So um, it is indeed uh, a great opportunity for all of us to hear from one of the the great minds uh, on this issue throughout the country. Uh, Professor Shinoy is, has received his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from UC Irvine, his PhD in electrical engineering from MIT, his postdoc and senior postdoc in neurology from Caltech. Um, this is a resume unlike um, most that we will come across in our lifetimes. He's been a professor at Stanford since 2001 and is now a full professor at Stanford University in departments of electrical engineering, neurobiology, bioengineering, among others. He recently received the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, 2009 through 2014, and in 2010, Stanford University's Postdoc Mentoring Award. So uh, let's put our hands together and welcome a true visionary. Doctor. Thank you, Jackie, for the very uh, kind introduction, and thank you to all the organizers. It's a true pleasure and honor to be here. And I'll just add uh, one point, which is that we have another thing in common. I, too, was rejected from Stanford as an undergraduate. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I turned them down for graduate school, so I called it even and then, <laughs> then, then felt I could go there. So. Uh, I'm mindful of the fact that you're sharing your very valuable lunchtime and uh, you all have very busy schedules. So what I've tried to do here is put together a rather succinct, high level, but hopefully specific and educational talk that should run maybe 25, maybe 30 minutes to leave plenty of time for question and answers. And the title that was suggested is Mind Over Matter. And what you'll be hearing about is how we can help paralyzed patients 
think about moving prosthetic arms or uh, moving computer cursors on the screen when uh, a severe neurological disease or injury has impacted their lives. So let me just jump right in and again state the problem is that millions of people are unable to move or to communicate. And this one slide, this is the only sort of complicated slide, is just to show you some prevalence data from a recent Christopher and Dana Ree Foundation report, which describes that there are roughly five and a half million people in the US alone <laughs> suffering from paralysis. And the three leading causes are stroke at 29%, spinal cord injury at 23%, and multiple sclerosis at 17%. And this wedge at the very top called other is a little bit of a misnomer. This is the catch all for things like our injured war fighters, our nation's heroes who have lost limbs, uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease which leave you profoundly um, locked in, unable to move, um, as well as brainstem stroke. And I'll be showing you movies of patients suffering from those very illnesses doing things that 10 years ago I think most of the world would have thought is impossible. Okay? And this reflects the work of the whole community, not just our own work. I want to give you a snapshot that really represents where the state of the art is at. Okay. Now, the pie chart is fine, but what it really boils down to, of course, is people in the end. It always does. And this picture, which, sorry, is a little bit washed out here due to the light, is a picture of Christopher Reeve, which I think most of you in the audience uh, will remember, uh, although I am running into my own undergraduates, not quite knowing who Christopher Reeve is, <laughs> so maybe I'll have to update this slide. But for those of us that remember, uh, he was Superman, right? And in 1995, very unfortunately, he was thrown from his horse and broke his spinal cord, and from that day forward, was no longer able to walk, to move his arms, and perhaps less appreciated, he was no longer able to really speak Clearly, You can see that he has a ventilation tube and from that day forward his life was <coughs> profoundly changed. Now despite being a person of considerable means and in fact setting up a foundation to go after this problem, uh, he passed away a few years ago, really unfortunately in no better quality of life state than he, he was soon after the injury. Okay. So how can we help people like Christopher Reeve? That's what it really boils down to. How can we help their quality of life be better. Now we'd all love for there to be a cure. And the type of cure that one could imagine comes in the form of regenerating the broken nerves in the spinal cord, okay? And that's a very hard problem that's been looked at for many, many decades. And it's because in the central nervous system, it's very hard to regrow those neurons. More recently, of course, and somewhat controversially, stem cell research, right? Maybe you can inject pre-differentiated cells into the spinal cord or the brain and have them regrow. But as I'm often fond of saying, I like my glasses a lot, okay? We haven't cured the fact that I can't see well, but with something like a prosthesis, your glasses, <coughs> I'm functional. So what is that counterpart to a pair of glasses, okay? And I haven't forgotten about Lasix. That's a, a little invasive and that's pretty cool too and that may be the better analogy. But if you look at this picture, an idea comes to mind. And this idea has been around for hundreds of years. And that is, is that maybe in Christopher Reeve's brain, the desire, the intention, the will to move is still there. It's just that those commands can't make it down the spinal cord. So everything's intact in the brain, but it just can't make it down the injured wires to reach the arms or the legs. So if we knew enough about where in the brain to look, and enough about how all the little electrical chattering that I'll tell you a little bit more about in the brain works, maybe we could go eavesdrop in on the signals in his brain, okay, and use those to drive prosthetic arms. That's the basic idea. It's really no more complicated than that, okay? So what does that look like? Well, this potential treatment is called brain-machine interfaces because you're interfacing the brain to some sort of machine. It's also referred to sometimes as brain-computer interfaces when you're controlling something on a computer or sometimes neural prostheses. And what we're seeing here is a side view of a brain and looking at the arm that you wish to move. And the way signals normally flow is that the signals 
uh, corresponding to where your hand are, vision in other words, come in on the blue line to the rear part of your brain. And then as the line turns green, you start forming plans to move your arm. And then those plans are elaborated and set down the spinal cord to actually move the arm. Now, of course, if this is no longer intact due to spinal cord injury, what we might be able to do is eavesdrop in on the electrical neural signals. Okay, and I'll describe a little bit more how we do this, but the short version is go ahead and neurosurgically implant tiny electrodes in the outer regions of the brain. Okay, uh, my neurosurgery colleagues sort of call this barely a neurosurgery because <laughs> it's right on the surface, but we do need to be respectful that it is an invasive procedure. Okay, take those electrical signals from the brain and somehow decipher them, decode them, decrypt them and then convert those signals through a set of mathematical algorithms that we might be able to run on computer chips, okay, low power hardware that we could implant in the brain, and then finally deliver those control signals or those computer signals to a prosthetic arm, okay, not unlike the DARPA arm that's been recently created, I'll show you some movies on that in a second, or if you have your arm intact, if it hasn't been amputated, if your arm is intact, you can actually electrically stimulate the muscles in your arm called functional electrical stimulation to reanimate the arm. Or go ahead and directly control a computer cursor on a screen to type out messages to loved ones, your physician, interface with the web. You know, today, again, versus 10 years ago, if you have virtual presence online, that really lifts the quality of life for lots of people. I mean, these are patients telling us that that's what they want. Okay? So that's the basic proposition. How can we set about actually making this a reality? Okay, so let me give you a very quick summary as to why I don't think we're entirely crazy. Okay, it's always possible. Okay, this is usually, uh, if I didn't have a congresswoman in the back of the room from California, this is normally where I joke that we are from California, we may well be crazy. We're never quite sure. <laughs> but I don't think we're crazy, and here's why. Here's what we're proposing. We're proposing that the brain goes ahead and takes in vision and other sensory uh, uh, signals into the brain. The brain does some processing and it just can't make it out. And all we want to do is build a bypass, a prosthesis, just bypass that injury, okay? And we don't think we're crazy because we've seen this in at least two other domains before. And the first is cochlear implants. How many people know somebody with a cochlear implant? Okay, that's, that's about right which is to say that a group this size, given that it's 2013, and given that there's hundreds of thousands of these systems in place, we all know, or with one degree of separation, know somebody that's profoundly deaf, even potentially born that way. And what you can do is you can take a little microphone, a little set of electronics, you can implant it, and then electrically stimulate the auditory nerve and the other auditory centers of the brain, and you're able to not only hear, but ultimately learn language, right? Children that are born congenitally deaf are actually able to interpret these signals well enough that you're able to learn language. So here, we've built a bypass, not we, but those that have come before us, okay? Uh, particularly UCSF, not to uh, give the rival school too much credit, but uh, the, the uh, systems work, they're FDA approved, they're going in, they're helping people profoundly, and we are writing signals into the brain, okay? Second, Parkinson's disease, okay? And I won't ask for a raise of hands here because I know that uh, many, many of us know people that are suffering from Parkinson's disease, uh, particularly as uh, the aging of America continues on, that prevalence will grow. And what's happening in Parkinson's disease, of course, is that uh, a whole variety of motor disorders kick in, perhaps most iconically a tremor starts, okay? And usually you go on a drug therapy for a while and that may become ineffective. And what has been going on for at least the last 10 years in the US, even before that in Europe, is that you can go ahead and put in a pacemaker-like unit in the chest, as shown down here, run a wire up to an electrode that's about four inches long implanted deep into the brain to a structure called the globus pallidus and trickle in small amounts of electric current that disrupt some form of aberrant neural activity and that tremor just stops. It's truly like magic. 
Okay? So am I saying that people are walking around all the time now with electrodes in their brains, day and night having little amounts of electric current go into their brains, just like a pacemaker does to your heart? Yes. Okay? So with the cochlear implant and the deep brain stimulator constantly sending signals into the brain, let's return now to this proposition, which I hope seems a little less crazy now, okay, of trying to read signals out of the brain. That's all we're doing. Okay? So again, what we want to do to help people, for example, move a prosthetic arm is to read signals out of the brain and bypass the injury. And we can do this by tapping into the right areas of the brain often called the motor cortex, the region right about here on the brain, which is responsible for moving your arm. Okay? In fact, if you go to the right side, that's responsible for moving your left arm and vice versa. And then hooking it up to, for example, a prosthetic arm. Okay? So the last setup slides before I start showing you some movies of how these systems are working and where we need to take the research from here is shown in this slide. So what I've done is I've zoomed in on a region of the brain where we may want to put an electrode or more than one, okay? And what I'm showing you next to a penny and then zoomed up is something that looks a little bit onerous until I tell you the size. So this is about four by four millimeters. It's a little piece of silicon, just like a computer chip. It's about the size of your pinky fingernail or baby aspirin, okay? And then you see 100 tiny electrodes that are each one millimeter long, right? So that's very, very shallow, and then you go ahead and you put that right into the outer surface of the brain called the cortex, okay? So it is absolutely a neurosurgery, okay? But it sits right there on the outer surface of the brain, and it's very fortuitous that the regions we need to target just present themselves right on the surface, okay? So you don't need to displace other tissue, you don't need to damage other tissue, uh, as is often done in neurosurgery to resect a tumor or something like that, okay? And then the tips of these electrodes come to reside very close to individual nerve cells. Okay? And this is really the key point of this slide. These electrode tips are able to pick up on individual cells in your brain called neurons. And there are billions of these neurons. So if you just put the electrode array in randomly, you'll have the tips come to rest pretty close to one or a couple of these different neurons. Okay? So this technique of putting in the electrode array directly into the brain is giving you unprecedented levels of information. Okay, and an analogy sometimes helps, which is to say, if I drop in a microphone in from the ceiling here, and I drop it right next to you, I can understand exactly your conversation. But if that microphone were instead way up above the ceiling, all I could do is maybe tell generally what was going on in the audience. Similarly, when we put these electrodes right next to individual nerve cells, we're able to pick up on huge amounts of information, and we need that information to do complicated things like move an arm. If you just try to put the electrodes on the outside of your scalp, for example, like EEG, which is very tempting because that's non-invasive, right? That's what you'd rather do. That's like having the microphone outside the room. You're not able to pick up on the detailed conversations and the detailed information that you need. Okay? Now, Coming off each one of these electrodes, I'm just showing you what happens on one, are these little electrical traces. And in some regions, you don't see sharp deflections, but a little later in time, you do see these sharp deflections. And this is how the brain chatters with itself. This is how the brain encodes information. And what I'm meaning is every time there's one of these sharp deflections called an action potential or a spike, okay? And if you count the number of them, it could mean, for example, that if you don't count any, you're wanting to move your arm to the left. But when you count many of them, you may want to move your arm to the right. Okay? Now, that same neuron will tell you something if you want to move your arm up or down, and each neuron tells you this very specific, quantitative, mathematically quantitative uh, amount about how you want to move your arm. And if we had just one of these neurons, we might be able to tell left from right. But if you give me a second neuron, I can do a lot better. If you give me a third neuron, I can do a lot better. By the time you give me a hundred neurons, because I have a hundred electrodes, I can tell you from those signals, meaning our mathematical algorithms can, exactly how fast and exactly what direction you want to move your arm, if you want to open or close your hand, if you want to move individual fingers. 
So you're able to glean a huge amount of information that starts becoming really uh, relevant for the quality of life improvements that we're seeking. Okay? And if we can hear my laptop there, uh, there aren't speakers, I'm going to play you just a little bit of raw recording so you can hear these signals. You'll hear some quiet, and then you'll hear some chatter. And this is real brain signal recordings, okay? So it's quiet now. That's when it, you're moving your arm to your right. To your right. Okay, now the arm's coming back. And the arm's moving to the right. Okay? So it's a little bit eerie here, right? What you're actually hearing is one of the billions of neurons, not from your brain, but from somebody's brain, <laughs> when they're moving their arm, right? So if you think about it too much, it might start to drive you a little bit crazy because it's like, oh, this chattering's going on in my head, right? But, <laughs> but that's what's actually going on electrically in your brain, okay? So is that, does that make sense? Okay, so big picture here is we implant one of those electrodes, we can pull out a huge amount of information. I won't <coughs> bore, you, bore you with the math. Now let's see what we can do with that information, okay? So the big leap from animal models in research labs to humans came in 2006 when good friends and colleagues Lee Hochberg and John Donahue at Brown and MGH were the very first to implant that exact electrode sensor, shown again here, in a spinal cord injured patient, okay? And there's a little connector that you'll see more in the movie that you have to plug into. Don't worry about that connector too much. That can absolutely be done away with, with wireless transmission systems that we're all accustomed to from our cell phones, okay? And here's the type of thing that can be done. So uh, again, my apologies, the contrast isn't great here, but what you're going to see is now not that original patient, but we're now up to the year 2012, okay? So again, uh, exactly as Jackie described, this is NIH, VA, and DARPA funds fueling all this, okay? You're going to see um, a brainstem stroke participant who is not able to move, has a connector hooking up to this electrode array that's been implanted. Those signals are being decoded and coming around to move that robotic arm, and she'll pick up this bottle and drink coffee for the first time in many years, okay? And at the end, her facial expression really tells, really tells the story. So the robotic arm that you're seeing there is moving only by her neural commands, only by her thoughts. Now she's thinking about grasping it. She grasped it. When it gets close enough, then for safety reasons, the computer takes over and doesn't let it come too close to her face. But is able to tip it, she's able to drink. Now she wants to set it back down. So she's very proud. So again, what's so important to keep in mind here, exactly, yeah. So what's so important to keep in mind here is, right, she's, she's somebody's mother, right? She's one of us, right? If we've been injured that badly for that long, having some ability to do something independently is profoundly important, right? You know, if you have young kids, you know that by the time they're maybe 18 months, you know, they want to do stuff independently, and then for the rest of our lives, we have that independence streak. So that's, that's what's being enabled, okay? Now, look, the glass is half full and half empty here, no pun intended, right? It's half full because it's working, right? It's still sort of half empty because it's not super quick, right? And it's not the type of system that you can imagine wanting to use for yourself or a loved one anytime soon, but the point is, is that it's now possible. Right? And the rate at which these systems are growing in their abilities is really quite profound. 
As evidence of that, let me show you a couple more clips. And I know that what was sent around was the 60 Minutes clip by Andrew Schwartz, another good friend and colleague at the University of Pittsburgh. And I have just truncated out three short clips from that overall 60 Minutes piece because I think it does a better job than anybody in describing really absolutely what the current state of the art is with the robotics. And the third clip will also go ahead and point out one of the limitations, right? So it's not to rain on anybody's parade. It's simply to make sure that I'm delivering a, uh, you know, a somber, <laughs> accurate view, which is we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. Okay? In a decade of war, more than 1,300 Americans have lost limbs on the battlefield. And that fact led the Department of Defense to start a crash program to help veterans and civilians by creating an artificial arm and hand that are amazingly human. But that's not the breakthrough. We don't use that word very often because it's overused. But when you see how they have connected this robotic limb to a human brain, you will understand why we made the exception. To take this ultimate step, they had to find a person willing to have brain surgery to explore new frontiers of what it is to be human. That person would have to be an explorer with desperate need, remarkable courage, and maybe most of all, a mind that is game. Okay, so the particular focus here, right, is indeed the 1,300 warfighters uh, war that have come back with profound injury or amputation from the various theaters of war. And this is really the brainchild of Colonel Jeff Ling at DARPA, who is uh, probably familiar to many of you, but has funded uh, our work, this work, and a large amount of work over nearly the last decade to really go after this sort of like a moonshot, really just drive this particular program with VA and with NIH. Here's how it works. They plugged her brain into the computer, and this is what we saw. I can move it up and straight down and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it and I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really? Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Okay. Let me grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> That's amazing. What are you doing, Jan? What's going on in your mind as you're moving this arm around? What are you thinking? Okay, the best way to explain it is raise your arm. Uh-huh. Now, right. what did you think about when you did that? Well, not very much. I do it all the exactly. time. Exactly. It's automatic. Is that hard work? Are you having to concentrate? It no, it was hard work getting the there. Here I struggled are, greatly. That's a much better looking arm. That's showing a lot more dexterity, right? And uh, it's just growing exponentially now, what we're able to do with these systems, okay? And the last point made is really the elephant in the room question, which is, how are you doing that, okay? And that has everything to do with where we put the electrode array. By putting that electrode array in nominally exactly the right region of the brain, which is normally involved in moving your arm, all you have to do is try to move your arm again. And it's a little hard, there's not really language, <laughs> good words to describe that, because it is subconscious. When you move your arm, you don't consciously think about it. But just sort of try or imagine moving your arm is all you need to say, and then people can start <coughs> using the systems right off the bat. There is no long training period, it just works, okay? Final segment. So this will point out, so this is Professor Andy Schwartz, and this will describe something that is perhaps surprising, but the system cannot do. And this really, I think, uh, uh, symbolizes this ongoing mystery of how the brain works, the fundamental need for understanding more and more about the basic brain science. Because without that, we can only get so far on these systems, and we'll hit something. Andy Schwartz believes that will help with some of the things that Jan has trouble with. Okay. For example, sometimes when she looks right at an object, she can't grab it. Okay, I'm going to take the cone away. Just go ahead and close it. Oh, sure. So as no soon as problem. I take the cone away, there's no problem. But as soon as I put the cone there, she can't do it. Why yeah. well, is still a mystery. Huge mystery. Okay. 
So what is going on, <coughs> if you hold out an object, in this case this red cone, she can bring the hand over here, but then she can't squeeze. She can't squeeze it. Having something to do with looking at it or attending to it or the color red. But if in the exact same location that object's taken away, then she can close it, okay? And what that's really saying to the neuroscience community is something we've known for a long time, which is these signals that we're tapping into are largely motor signals, but they're involved in super interesting and exquisite ways with sensory processing and cognitive signals and other mental functions. We have to go decipher that, okay? It's be sort of like cracking open your laptop and hooking up to a wire and saying, okay, I think I know how it works. And you do, basically, but then you'll get surprised from time to time. Oh, that was doing something else as well, okay? So that's sort of a snapshot of where the robotic work stands. Now, in the remaining five or eight minutes here, let me describe what some of the ongoing challenges are that I sort of foreshadowed, okay? So this is all very encouraging, I and we as a field think, okay? But we're also very mindful of the fact that they're not yet clinically viable. And by that I mean we wouldn't want to say uh, they're ready for prime time, okay? Because there are these issues. There are many real world issues and some other neuroscience issues that we should tackle first, okay? So for example, we need to get rid of that connector that you saw, obviously, okay? It's a bit of an infection risk. It's not aesthetically pleasing. Those things absolutely matter. We can do that with wireless systems. We want to get rid of all the various computers that are running all those algorithms. That's sort of a miniaturization problem that can be done. Safely securing the prosthetic arm to the patient. If you have an amputation, actually physically connecting the arm there in a, in a durable way uh, has been a historic issue for, for many centuries, but it still is an issue. Okay, and safely moving or not moving the arm day and night. It doesn't do a person too much good to have the arm sitting there but always need help donning and doffing it, putting it on and off. You'd like to somehow be able to leave it on day and night and so forth, okay? So I won't speak about those. There are also several fundamental neuroscience and engineering challenges, two of which I will just very briefly through movies describe, okay? First is performance. We need to improve that straightness of moving to an object, the speed, the stopping ability, all these real world metrics that would make it so that we would actually want to use it, okay? And robustness. These signals, uh, how long do they last? They better last many years. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to want a neurosurgery every two months, right? <laughs> so how, how does that work, okay? And finally, just because uh, uh, it's very timely given the events of last week here in Washington, uh, new basic neuroscience is very much needed and will help the prosthetics work. So I want to describe very briefly in just one slide what don't we know about the brain area and how that connects to President Obama's brain initiative. And that's what I was referring to the announcement last week. They're deeply connected. They're highly consonant. Okay? So let's describe now the same system you've seen before, but now we want to read out the signals and type letters on a keyboard. So we'll call this a communication prosthesis just to differentiate it from a robotic arm prosthesis, okay? They're highly related, but the goal here will be to hit the right key and to hit it accurately, okay? So imagine typing and you being able to only type two words per minute. That's really frustrating. So if we can start having you type faster, that becomes better and so forth, okay? And I'll spare you multiple PhD theses worth of work, okay, and just show you the result. So after many years of work uh, with some of the same agencies, I'm not going to show you what a monkey can do. Why a monkey? Well, we can train them to do exquisite things and their brains are so homologous, similar to humans, it is the animal model that all this work must be done in before going to human, okay? Just like so much of the pharmaceutical industry must as well. So the green target comes on a screen right in front of a monkey. He's just sitting there comfortably. He's neurally controlling, just like you saw in the, in the participants, this white cursor. Okay, and here's how it works. So it's able to go straight there. It's able to do so fairly quickly. And it's able to stop on a dime. Okay, and that really represents by a factor of at least two uh, new world record performance, okay? And the, what makes that work? The math, <laughs> okay? So uh, 
Math matters. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, if you use that system to start bringing it more into sort of a, a communication interface, and again, my apologies, it's washing out a little bit, what you can see here very lightly is an eight by eight grid of targets, one of which is illuminated, and we just say, please hit that dot. Okay? So it comes up there and hits a dot. Okay? And you can hit any of them on that 64 key keyboard. And this is starting to look more like an actual keyboard on your desk, right? And what are you hearing? You're hearing the crackling, sorry, it just ended, but you're hearing the crackling from just one neuron. We're recording from 99 others, but you can sort of hear that brain chatter driving it. And so the final movie on this segment is to say, okay, let's take the final step. Uh, and let me just point out something very clearly. We showed the animal all the yellow dots on this six by six keyboard, 36 keys, that's plenty to do the English alphabet, 26 letters, and some numbers, and some special characters, okay? But we have not taught our monkeys how to read English, okay? So, <laughs> so, so it, it's, it, it's a fair comparison, but we, I want to be very clear here. If, if we could do that, I think that would be what I'd be working on now, probably. <laughs> okay. But the point here is we can cue with a green dot the next character to be hit and just clip through these pretty quickly. Okay, and every time he comes over and selects that key by moving over and holding it for half a second, that letter gets transferred down, and you can start seeing that he's spelling out a message to you. Okay, and uh, this movie goes on and on and on, and I won't I won't show you the whole thing. But if he makes a mistake, what we then instruct him to do, if he hits the wrong key, we come over and have him hit the delete key, and keep going. So it's a real world interface that allows us to know that we're able to type about 10 words per minute. And depending on your skill and your experience with your iPhone or your Blackberry, 10 words per minute isn't maybe exactly as good as the best of you in the room, but it's sort of on par with what you can do with text messaging, right? So it's starting to become a very, uh, in the right ballpark, usable interface. Okay, robustness. Just one slide. These systems can work for over four to five years, okay? There are some advances that were needed to get this to work, but what I'm showing you on the vertical axis is some performance metric, how well does it work? Doesn't matter exactly the details. And across four years, and what I'm showing you is that those curves are basically flat, meaning you don't see these electrode arrays disintegrate. There's nothing bad that happens in the brain. They are absolutely inert. They're just silicon with polyimid, the same type of stuff that the biomedical industry puts in. So the proposition is there that we can get performance way up and we can get robustness way up, okay? So can we now translate these laboratory advances, performance and robustness, to clinical participants, okay? And the answer is yes. We've just started doing this at Stanford starting late last year, okay, after many, a uh, couple of years of FDA paperwork. Uh, and we now have what I'm going to show you in this video, which is an ALS uh, participant performing a task better than ALS participants had been able to do before. ALS, which is a motor degenerative disease, has this unique feature to it, which is that it's unclear if the outer regions of the brain, the cortex, remain intact enough for you to pick up on those signals. If the target itself has deteriorated, uh, then that may not be possible. So it was previously completely unknown if this would work. So the same setup that you've seen before uh, and now we, our first participant at Stanford in this clinical trial is a 50-year-old female with Lou Gehrig's disease who still has some residual ability to move, but that will be lost, okay? And what I want to put in your mind is that as we get better at these systems, you don't want to wait until all functionality is lost. You know, if it's a, if it's a traumatic injury, then you have no choice because you didn't predict that that was going to happen. But if it's a degenerative disease, before you've lost all ability, you probably want to implant one of these systems to learn as much as you can, and then the patient can make a more informed decision as to whether they want you know, to go ahead and use that type of system moving forward or whether they would like to exercise other options in their, in their care, okay? So what you're seeing here is a little white cursor that's being moved by her thoughts alone, just like before and is moving out to the green dot, and then is holding there for about 500 milliseconds, okay? 
So the key point here is this is the first time an ALS participant has been able to achieve this level of performance at all, number one. And number two, it's still early days. This level of performance is not what we find satisfactory. It reminds us very much of the state of the art a few years ago. But when we start turning on some of those advances I've been describing from the laboratory, we think it should work much better. Okay? So the last slide, <coughs> what don't we know? Okay, well, now this could take days, <laughs> but instead I will do it in 45 seconds, okay? <laughs> we don't know an awful lot, okay? Uh, it's like we have a phrase book and we've just gone to France and we know enough French from this phrase book to, you know, maybe order dinner and maybe we didn't get exactly what we wanted, but we got food and we felt pretty good about ourselves. But boy, is that different from being fluent in French. Our current understanding of neuroscience has enabled us to have that phrase book, and that's what's enabling us to do these medical systems, these brain machine interfaces. But we have to become fluent. We have to know more and more about the brain, otherwise we'll just run into limits of what we're able to do, okay? So this is uh, something I'll just read quickly. The human brain is approximately three pounds, okay? Uh, of many billions of neurons and million, many trillions of connections. Neurons work together to coordinate the physical actions and mental processes that set humans apart. The brain is the most complex of all living known structures and its secrets hold the key to alleviating the burden of neurological disease and injury and likely a new engineering revolution, meaning computational, material, and power efficiency. If we knew how the brain worked, our computers would look very different, okay? So this is a confluence in time of engineering and neuroscience and clinical need that's all starting to intersect. The ability to deal with huge amounts of data, right? It's not as though Google has nothing to say about how brain science should be done and so forth, okay? So we currently know rather little about the brain, but a renaissance is starting to happen. How does the brain work and how can we repair it, okay? So what we currently have as limitations and what presumably the, uh, the brain initiative, the new initiative announced last week, <coughs> will tackle is to address some of the limitations like that we currently measure only one to maybe a hundred neurons at a time. But there are billions of neurons. This is ridiculous. We need to be measuring hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons at the same time. The technology exists to do that in limited ways. We need to scale that up. Okay. Second, we only measure for a few hours. Well, the lifetime of an organism is far longer than a few hours. And we therefore aren't really capturing how learning happens, how adaptation happens. We only measure how an animal or a person is able to participate in one or two different behaviors. But we all do thousands of different behaviors, walking, sitting, typing, thinking, boning in a day. For us to understand how the brain does all that, we have to study it beyond the very limited confines that we currently do. It's the current limitations provide us limited knowledge of quote unquote population dynamics, which is a little bit of a jargony term, but think about having all those neurons all chattering. You have to have a different understanding of how that all works together than can currently be understood by measuring one neuron or a few neurons at a time. Okay, it'd be like trying to understand the internet by looking at just one IP node. You have to look at the global view before you start understanding all that interactivity, vulnerabilities as well as opportunities. Anatomical and functional information is currently very separate. There's a whole group over here that loves to study at the microscopic level all the anatomy of the brain. There's a group over here, like I've been describing, which likes to think about the functionality. They're divorced. It's nuts. They have to come together. You can't understand a system without understanding it all together. Okay? This provides limited knowledge for the design of prostheses. We are being limited currently in what we can do in prostheses because of these problems. And finally, Boy, is this research slow, okay? The research has, yes, come a long way in the last 10 years. That's very important. I want that to be a take-home message to be sure. But we could absolutely go much, much faster if we weren't sort of working in this onesie, twosie individual lab ways. It's very much like physics was 100 years ago, okay? So, in summary, <coughs> brain-machine interfaces are now possible in people. Clinically viable systems are on the horizon, but challenges absolutely do remain. Real-world engineering, performance, and robustness. 
reading from and writing to, remember the cochlear implants and deep brain stimulators, that's writing to. So reading from and writing to the brain should enable a wide range of new treatments for neurological diseases and injuries far beyond just the motor-oriented ones I've described, right? I wanted to give you a very specific example of how we can help people with paralysis. But, you know, there is a huge range, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, of neurological diseases and disorders that are of increasing importance and burden on the nation that we need to get to, okay? So BMIs are one specific example of this type of medical system or treatment that can come from new neuroscience or neuroengineering research. And finally, it's uh, quite possible that the new brain initiative is very consonant with BMIs. Well, it is, it is very consonant with BMIs, but it's quite possible that BMIs will help contribute to that as well as benefit from that, okay? So final two slides. The most important slide I ever show is the wonderful team of students and postdocs it's just a joy to work with them. And in uh, more detail by name, I won't go through all this obviously, on the basic research side, things highlighted in blue are the students and postdocs and funding agencies, and on the new clinical effort uh, in the gray box, uh, including most importantly, quote unquote, T6, who is our participant, who is of course de-identified for privacy reasons. Thank you very much for your time. So I'm, I'm very happy to take questions if there is time. I don't know if there are. I actually do. Um, I do have a question. So it seems Please. like it would be very expensive for the, the robotic arms to be in people's homes or you know, to make that a clinical thing. So is there something that, that scientists are also working on to make the prices or? Ab absolutely, absolutely. So uh, reimbursement. Pricing of these systems is very much on people's minds now that it looks more and more possible that this will happen. Uh, the good news is that the robotics involved here, while you know extraordinarily expensive for the first one and the second one, ought to scale down. It, it's, it's, it's a classic enough technology that you ought to be able to project out how the cost will be driven down as volumes go up. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, I'm also not too worried about, you know, while it looks like, oh, there's these little sensors and there's electronics and everything, that's actually just the semiconductor industry, okay? So there, too, uh, we're talking just, I mean, I mean, I'm reasonably confident when I say under $10,000 to be sure, maybe even far less than that for all the implantables. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised at all if the dominant cost here, just like a pacemaker, just like a deep brain stimulator, isn't the implantable it would be the surgical time. It would be the, it would be the clinical care. So we're back to health care, and I won't touch that one. <laughs> um, one of the things I was wondering about is, is we, we talked a little bit about what we know and what we don't know. And you didn't really get into a whole lot of the science. You, went, you spoke to a level that was easy, was easy to understand. And I'm wondering about the depth of our understanding of the science and the applicability of these techniques to a wide range of disease conditions. Uh, are, we, are we largely there, or are we just on the cusp of learning? We're, we're on the cusp. We're on the cusp. Great question. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I try to keep this at a higher level. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of pure basic research, as does the field. Uh, the things that are learned in the BMI research here and in our own basic motor neuroscience uh, point to motifs, point to ways in which the brain are, is organized, how information is processed, that does generalize. It does tell you about how other systems in the brain work. But if you tried to say, well, what does this have to do with Alzheimer's or Huntington's, I would say that's probably very different because there you're dealing with different degenerative processes, uh, different things at a molecular and proteomic level. And there are communities that know a lot about that, but the communities aren't yet talking uh, as well as perhaps they could. And they're not sharing technological platforms that would, uh, that would sort of accelerate that either. So I would say that we're very much on the cusp, very optimistic that that can be unified, but we're, we're nowhere close. So, quick question: Is it easier to read a signal from the brain or write a signal to the brain? 
Uh, it's a great question. Uh, there are two answers, and one goes one way, one goes the other way. Okay. Um, so here, so the, uh, the the simpler answer first. It's easier to write to the brain. Okay. Why? I mean that in a very specific way, which is that if you insert a little electrode, like the deep brain stimulator, then even as through weeks and months, small uh, cellular layers build up around the electrode form, so-called gliosis, which is a very natural immune, immune response. You're able to maybe just turn up the current a little bit and still pass electric current through that small little scar. If you put an electrode in and try to record from it, but that little scar has taken those neurons and pushed them away too far, you can't hear them. It's like taking me too far away from the microphone. You just can't get that back. That's why stimulation is easier. Now, here's the second answer that says recording is easier. <laughs> okay? uh, not on that same topic. That physics that I just described is, I think, correct. What's hard about writing signals into the brain is back to this business of having this French phrase book. Okay? When you just electrically stimulate the brain, you are activating a whole bunch of different cells all at the same time and it comes across as very unnatural. Those patterns of activity wouldn't normally be present in the brain. Uh, so we have to get better at how to do that. And there are some brilliant things on the horizon that are starting to happen. For example, a term called optogenetics uh, that one of my colleagues, Carl Dysroth at Stanford, invented, which uses light to go ahead and activate individual cells that have been genetically targeted. So you can say, not all of you cells but just you cells that I've targeted because you're a certain type, when I flash the light, I want you to respond. So there's ways to become more uh, exquisite about being a symphony conductor and just saying I want you know, just the violas to play now as opposed to the whole, whole orchestra playing. On the recording side, it's in this, in this example, it's easy because when you listen in on the natural activity, you're listening in on the natural activity. So you can go ahead and correlate what's going on with the the person with the neural activity. Yeah. Yes. Well, when the implant is surgically, you talked about you know that that it's small, that it's mm -hmm. fortunate, that it doesn't have to go so deep. Right. Um, but is the location the same for all the activities that you described, or do you have to choose a different place for the motor activities from the? moving the cursor? That, that's a great question. So the, the brief answer, is, the, the key brief answer is same location. Okay, but let me unpack that a little bit more. So there's uh, several square centimeters of area in the human brain that is involved with moving the arm and grasping and so forth. Uh, and if you just think about moving the arm, uh, like you think about moving your arm to move a mouse cursor, but you actually see the cursor on the screen, after a while, you just start thinking about moving the cursor on the screen. You're, not, you're sort of not even aware that you're moving your mouse or your, your little pad on your laptop, right? So that's why you can use the same area. Now, a, a related, highly related question is, hey, from participant number one to participant number two, person one to person two, do you go to the same area, right? And the answer, again, is happily yes. Okay, and I mean that at two levels. One is that if you um, have uh, exposed the surface of the brain, a trained neurosurgeon can look at the patterns on the brain and just say, right there. There's enough landmarks that tells us where to go. Now, nothing says, you know, implant here, okay? The reason those patterns are meaningful is because we learned from the past hundred years of what the different areas of the brain generally do. Okay? And the second level, which I mean that you can go to the same area, is functional magnetic resonance imaging. Right? We can all go into an MRI tube, and not the type that might do our knee or our shoulder, but with an extra twist which shows oxygenation, deoxygenation levels in the brain, which tell you which areas of the brain are lighting up. So if you put a person in an fMRI tube and say, please think about moving your right arm, you'll see an area in the left side of your brain light up. And from person to person to person, that's pretty similar. And the extent to which it does shift around a little bit, we can know that ahead of time. And then when we go into surgery, we can implant specific to that patient right there. So any 
small amount of residual variance can also be taken into account. So that's also not a showstopper. Yeah. For, again, <laughs> as the question came, for these uh, important but still relatively simplistic systems, if we're talking about things like uh, stroke, you know, here, let me just float this idea, right? So uh, a system that several groups, including ours, are, are thinking deeply about is if you suffer a stroke in a certain region, um, what if you could listen in on the part of the brain that comes before the region of the brain that's been lost and then replace the functionality of the part of the brain that's been lost with some electronics and then go ahead and write the signals in to the area of the brain that the stroked out area would have gone to. So if you think about processing going from A to B to C, and B has been eliminated due to a stroke, can you replace B with a chip, read out A into the chip into C? For that type of system, then it may not be so stereotyped. You know, it may not be that you can always go to the same part of the brain. It really depends as we get deeper into the science what that will dictate in terms of these placements. All right. Looks like we're out of questions. Thank you.